Marriage is Covenant, presented by Paula Adair. Hello to everyone, especially the RCIA candidates and catechumens. My husband, Deacon Robin Adair, and I have been married for almost 45 years and have been involved in the Ministry of Marriage Preparation since approximately 1980. You might recognize me from Sunday Mass, at which I am active as a lector and Eucharistic minister. For the last several years, it has been my pleasure to do a presentation to the RCIA group on the Sacrament of Marriage. This year, I was scheduled to share with the group at the end of March. Unfortunately, RCIA and every other gathering was canceled. So Father Brown asked if I would prepare a video to share with you. I had hoped to have this video ready for you before Easter, but a small tornado and no electricity for three days put a damper on my plans. But with Easter comes light, electricity, and computer access. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the sacraments are signs and instruments by which the Holy Spirit spreads the grace of Christ, the head, throughout the Church, which is his body. They are perceptible signs, that is, words and actions, accessible to our human nature. You've already learned about the seven sacraments, but as a quick review, there are the sacraments of initiation, which are baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. These are the three sacraments a catechumen usually receives on Easter vigil, unless, of course, there is a coronavirus pandemic. Additionally, there are two sacraments of healing, reconciliation and anointing of the sick. And finally, there are two sacraments of service or vocation. Those are holy orders and matrimony. Today, we are going to focus on matrimony or marriage. Matrimony or marriage exists as a natural institution in almost all cultures. Most societies have some form of marriage. Our understanding and belief in marriage has developed throughout time. In Old Testament times, wives were considered little more than property and marriages could be dissolved like simple contracts. In the New Testament times, Jesus brought a new understanding about marriage. Marriage is transformational and becomes a covenant and a sacrament. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, the meanings of those two. And it's at this time that the church begins to think of marriage as a model of our relationship with God. It's a parallel. In the Old Testament, people are fearful of God, who is all powerful and separate from his people. Kind of like the property relationship that we have in marriage before Jesus comes along. They do not even dare speak the name of Yahweh. He is so powerful. In the New Testament, however, thanks to the ultimate revelation of Jesus, people begin to see God in terms of a personal relationship, as a covenant, just as we do in marriage today. So exactly what is the difference between a contract and a covenant? Well, first of all, Contracts are deal with things. I can have a contract to buy a car or a house. Those are things. A covenant, on the other hand, deals with persons. It's interpersonal. We have a contract that exists between people. As an example of this, the relationship of a man and a woman in the marriage covenant. Contracts are for stipulated times. When I buy a house, I agree to pay back the house loan in a number of years. On the other hand, a covenant lasts for a lifetime. It does not end. Contracts involve separation of the parties. Each party has some obligation that they put into the contract. They say, I will sell you my house if you give me $100,000.
Covenants, on the other hand, are about sharing what the two people involved in the covenant do together. Contracts can be broken. If I go back to our example of the house, if I don't pay my house loan each month, the person who sold me the house is allowed to take the house back from me because I've broken the contract. Covenants, on the other hand, are irrevocable. And we get into this when we talk about divorce. We say that marriage can't be ended by divorce because it's irrevocable, just like a covenant. Contracts are understood by lawyers. It takes a lawyer to write out pages and pages of a contract when you buy or sell things. If you've ever purchased a house yourself, you know how many pages of a contract you have to sign. Covenants, on the other hand, are personal. They are something that are written on our hearts, something that is understood between the two people. Contracts are witnessed by people. So this means that because they're witnessed by people, they can have imperfections. They have their limitations. On the other hand, a covenant is witnessed by God. It's eternal and it's true. Contracts can be made by children. And when I say children, I refer to immature people, those who do not understand. And these are specifically written because we need a list of rules within our contracts so that the child or the immature person can understand it. The covenant, on the other hand, is made only by mentally, emotionally, and spiritually mature adults. These are people who have a true understanding of what the covenant is. In order to see how marriage has evolved, we first need to look to scripture and see what the biblical history of marriage is. If we look at the Gospel of John, we can read about the wedding at Cana. Cana is the location of the wedding at which Jesus performed his first miracle. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it, and then the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely an inferior one, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. This passage from John is so rich in meaning, but just a couple takeaways that apply to our topic of today. The first thing is that for a wedding to be a true marriage, we as Christians must invite Jesus to be there. As it says here in verse Two, Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. It's important to have Jesus there so that God can be at the center of our marriage. The second important thing out of this passage is that Jesus transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary. Jesus does this constantly throughout scriptures. But in this passage, 
his, the transformation is from water into wine. And not just any wine, but the best wine. The transformation is exceptional. Just in the same way, Jesus, by being present here, transforms what was simply a wedding into a true marriage, into a covenant relationship that we've just talked about. He also here talks about a changing the distant relationship with God, because this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, where he becomes personally involved with those around him. The distant relationship with God is transformed into a personal relationship. Jesus becomes involved in the everyday life of those around him. So how does Cana represent a change in belief about marriage? And in order to answer that question, we need to look at what marriage was like before Jesus. So I like to look at the, this passage from Matthew chapter 19. In this passage, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament and showing us how things have changed. Some Pharisees approached him and tested him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever? He said in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. They said to him, Then why did Moses command that the man give the woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? He said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, and marries another, commits adultery. So when we look at line four, we see Jesus quoting Genesis. He says that God intended man and woman to be permanently joined, to be united as one flesh, both spiritually and physically. He said this was the intent from the very beginning. But obviously he knows that mankind and womankind have strayed from this belief of what marriage is. After he makes this statement, the Pharisees in line in verse 7 respond to him with a quote about Moses and divorce. And Jesus responds to them that the only reason you've been allowed to divorce is because of your stubbornness. And he wants them to put aside their stubbornness and realize that it is not lawful to divorce. That no man or woman should divorce because, again, it's a covenant and it is eternal. Jesus has just elevated or transformed the belief of what marriage is. This next reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's written at a time when wives were thought of as property and husbands the owners of that property. So this represents a big change in thinking about marriage. Paul says, Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of his wife just as Christ is head of the church, he himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, 
and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the Church. Again, it's important to remember the context of the times when reading this passage. When in his very first sentence Paul says, Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ, Paul is changing the whole idea of marriage. No longer property and owner. But in this case, he says, be subordinate to one another. He then goes on to say, or to define what the husband should think and do. He says, the husband should be head as Christ is head. Remember, Christ came to serve and to submit to the will of the Father, not to do just as he wanted. He was submitting to the will of the Father. He came in the role of service. So when Christ, or when Paul tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, he is calling on them to give their all for their wife, even to the point of death, just as Christ did for the church. And he is telling husbands to submit to the will of the Father, not to their own will. This is a very important change in how we think about the marital relationship. Also, this last line in, the, in this passage, it's a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ in the church. Not only is Paul talking about how we should change our thinking about what marriage is, he's telling us we need to change how we think about the church, how we think about our relationship to God how our relationship to, to, with the Father should now be a personal one because we have Jesus as the intercessor. Remember, how does Christ lead or head the church? Christ doesn't lead by setting down rules. The only rule that he ever gives the church is that they should, tells us that we should love God and love our neighbor. No, Jesus came to serve. He led by action and by serving the people around him. Okay. After Christ, how did marriage evolve? How did the church evolve? And by understanding marriage, we can better understand how the church evolved. In 107 AD, Ignatius, who was a martyr and bishop of Antioch, said that marriage should only be done with the approval of a bishop. It could not be a civil, just a civil uh, undertaking. It had to be done with the approval of the church. Tertullian, who is a writer who lived from approximately 160 to 225 AD wrote a beautiful, beautiful passage about marriage uh, that still is very appropriate for today. He says, how beautiful then the marriage of two Christians, two who are one in hope, one in desire, one in the way of life they follow, one in the religion they practice. Notice he's putting religion at the center of the relationship. Nothing divides them either in flesh or in spirit. They are in very truth, two in one flesh. Where there is but one flesh, there is also but one spirit. They pray together, they worship together, they fast together, instructing one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. Side by side, they visit God's church and partake of God's banquet. Side by side, they face difficulties and persecutions, share their consolations. They have no secrets from one another. They never shun each other's company. They never bring sorrow to each other's hearts. This beautiful description definitely applies today. And it said, if you want to know how to have a marriage that lasts a lifetime, this is how to do it by following the words of this passage. He also says, to such as these, he gives his peace. Where there are two together, there also he is present, and where he is, there is, evil is not. 
Now remember, this is not only a good description for matrimony, but it is also a good description of church and its members. What life among the members of a church should be, should be like. Why we gather on Sundays to share because God is present there. Augustine, the patron of our parish, who lived approximately 354 to 430 AD, wrote on good of marriage. It's one of his many things that he wrote. And in On Good of Marriage, he discusses three values that should be true within marriage. The first is fidelity. In other words, the parties of the marriage should be faithful to one another. Adultery should never enter into the marriage. They should, uh, it should never involve divorce. Marriage should involve offspring. In other words, it should be open to children. And finally, he said that marriage is a sacrament. And remember, we go back to that definition of sacrament that I listed at the beginning. It's a sign of eternal unity. And it's something that brings the grace of God to those who are united in it. So within this marriage, God enters into the relationship. By the fourth century, the form of marriage was developing. And over the years, the form of the wedding itself has changed. I mean, the way we do a wedding today was not what they did back then, the white dress and, and all the other trimmings. But the belief in the sacramentality of marriage has not changed over the years. And I can show you that through these different things. In the fourth century, they were already using a priestly blessing and sharing Eucharist when they were married. This process continues. And in 1139, the Lateran Council was called. Now, what is a council? A council is where the Pope has the bishops come together and they discuss things. And usually when the Pope calls the council, it's because something is a, coming about within the church that uh, there are big questions about. There might be heresies arising within the church that the Pope feels needs addressed or the bishops feel need addressed. So they gather together and they discuss at these councils what they truly believe. The Lateran Council, they stated that marriage is as true a sacrament as Eucharist and baptism. It definitely was a sacrament. It does bring the presence of God into the couple's relationship. In 1184, the Council of Verona, again, it was re-verified. Marriage is a sacrament. It is a sign of God's love. In 1274, another council is called. And at this council, they listed marriage as one of the seven sacraments. The seven sacraments were explicitly defined as they are today, this far back. In 1439, at the Council of Florence, it was reaffirmed that sacraments contain grace, and other God is present at the time of the sacrament, and they confer it upon those who receive the sacrament. In 1547, a council was held in Trent. This is occurring during the Protestant Reformation, and it addressed the disputed aspects of the Catholic religion at the time. At this council, the church reaffirmed that there were indeed seven sacraments. It also reaffirmed the fact that the marriage must be before a priest and witnesses in order for it to be a valid marriage. It could not be just a civil action. The Council of Trent also stated that a valid marriage cannot be dissolved. 
Divorces were not allowed. Then in modern times, the Second Vatican Council was held from the years 1962 to 1965. At this council, the church defined marriage as a conjugal covenant of irrevocable personal consent. What this means, first of all, conjugal just refers to marriage, but covenant we've already spoken about. It involved mature people, it was personal, it was written on the heart, and it placed God at the center of the relationship. Irrevocable in this definition means that it cannot be ended by divorce. A valid marriage exists forever. And finally, the word consent means that the two parties have to agree to the marriage. This is done at the time that they make their vows. The only way that marriage could be declared null is if some essential element for validity was missing, and it had to be missing from the beginning of the marriage. In other words, from the time the parties were come, came to be together till the, they had their wedding vows and throughout their life. This was very different from the concept of divorce. It's what we refer to today as an annulment. So what are the effects and the elements of a marriage? Every sacrament confers grace upon those who receive it. In marriage, there are two effects. The first is that it unites the couple. It means that the marriage is made up of equal partners, but it is important to note that the source of the love that sustains the marital relationship is not the partners themselves, but God who calls the partners together. God is an essential part of the marriage. He makes the relationship extraordinary and unlimited. This unitive effect also means that the relationship is a covenant. It is permanent. It cannot be ended. It is exclusive, and I don't mean just sexually exclusive, but also spiritually and emotionally exclusive. Spouses should be their best friends. A covenant is also faithful, and that involves both good times and bad. The second effect of grace entering into a relationship is that the relationship is procreative. In other words, it is open to new life. Now, marriage also contains certain elements. The first is that marriage is a vocation. It is a call, a way of life. There is an expression, a wedding is a day, but a marriage is a life, lifetime. Marriage is a lived sacrament. I told you at the beginning that the deacon and I have been married for 45 years, not that we were married 45 years ago. This vocation also has a mission, and the, and the mission is that the marriage is to help each other get to heaven and to show others that the love of God exists in the world. This is a very important mission of marriage. Finally, marriage is a sacrament. If it is between two baptized people. Otherwise, if it's between a Catholic and an unbaptized person, it's a blessed union. Should, however, that non-baptized party be baptized at some later date, the marriage automatically becomes a sacrament without further action. Marriage is also a call to love. In this beautiful passage from Corinthians, which is often used at weddings today, uh, Paul says, love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous, it is not pompous, it is not inflated, it is not rude, it does not seek its own interest, it is not quick-tempered, 
It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is what all couples are called to in their marital relationship. Every sacrament also has a mark or a sign. For example, in baptism, the water and the oil are the marks, or two of the marks of the sacrament. In confirmation, oil is used. In the Eucharist, we have the signs of the bread and wine. These signs are the words and actions that we can see and experience in our human nature that actually bring God's grace to us. Now, it's important to note that weddings can take place with or without a mass. They're not dependent upon having a mass. We often have weddings without a mass when couples are Catholic and non-Catholic so that the both parties can fully participate in the events. There is a line that you'll never hear at a Catholic wedding. That line is, by the power invested in me by the state, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Now, why is that? Why don't we use that line at a Catholic service? Well, it's because in the sacrament of marriage, spouses are actually the ministers of the sacrament. When the spouses speak the words of consent, in other words, the vows, when they say, I, Paula, take you, Robin, to be my husband, or I, Robin, take you, Paula, to be my wife, those are the words of consent, and they are the mark of the sacrament. They are the words that confer the grace of God upon the couple. They are the marriage covenant. What makes a marriage a valid marriage? Well, first of all, the consent must be freely given. Because the words of consent are the mark of the sacrament, as I just said, the words must be freely given by the couple, not forced. They must be in canonical form. Canonical simply means the law of the church, according to the law of the church. They have to be stated before a priest or deacon and two witnesses and they must involve a bride and a groom. In order for the marriage to be valid, there must be no legal impediment for the couple. And when I say legal impediment, I mean both civil and canonical. They must have a civil marriage license in order to be married within the Catholic Church. What are the canonical impediments for a Catholic marriage? Age or lack of maturity. This is important because the couple must be free in their consent and mature enough to give that consent. Permanent impotency. The couple must be able to consummate the marriage. An existing valid marriage would be an impediment to marriage. This would involve either a Catholic marriage, a previous Catholic marriage, or any previous marriage, civil or otherwise, for a non-Catholic party. Neither party can be a priest or a religious unless they have been laicized or given permission by the church. A Catholic cannot marry a non-baptized person without dispensation or approval from the bishop. This is usually a fairly simple process. There cannot be abduction involved or crime, and the couple cannot be too closely related. Also, if the couple refuses to cooperate with the preparation process, this can be impediment to the uh, marriage and the quality of the consent at the time of the ceremony. In other words, if, the, if one of the parties is uh, inebriated, 
this would invalidate the marriage. The church doesn't believe in divorce, but the Catholic Church does have a process called annulment. An annulment simply means that some essential element that would have made the partnership, the relationship, a covenant, was missing from the beginning. Uh, we consider all marriages, whether they're Catholic, other church, or civil, valid until proven otherwise. And this involves not only the marriages of the Catholic partner, but marriages of a non-Catholic partner. Catholics are also required to follow the Catholic form in order for the marriage to be valid. So some of the grounds for annulment might include uh, an impediment. If, if the impediment that we listed just previously, if one of those existed at the time of the wedding and it was not known about and the marriage went ahead anyway, uh, that would be grounds for annulment. There might have been a defect in the consent given by the couple. An example of this would be is if the bride or the groom was under the influence at the time of the vows, then the consent would uh, not have been valid and, the, and thus the marriage could be annulled. There might also be some radical incapability for marriage. In other words, there's something about one of the spouses that prevents that person from making or understanding what a marriage truly is. They are not capable of being married. And another grounds for annulment might be that a condition has been placed by either party against the nature of the marriage. This would mean, for example, uh, if uh, one of the parties refuses to have children, that would be against the procreative nature of marriage. Or if one of the parties has had affairs before the marriage and as the marriage has progressed, that would be against the nature of the, the unitive nature of the marriage. The French philosopher and priest Teilhard de Chardin said this, Someday after mastering the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love, and then for the second time in the history of the world we will have discovered fire. True covenant marriage is a model of God's love working in the world. It is an example of how all are called to an extraordinary relationship with God, whether you are married, single, or religious. Thank you all for listening.